So this is a, a statue of Mozi in uh, Shantong in uh, China. And Mozi's dates, sorry, I should have had them there. Mozi's dates are somewhere between 480 to 390 BCE. Those are fairly rough dates, but uh, the belief is that he did live quite a long life. Not quite that long, I don't think, from 480 to 390 BCE, but quite a long life. And he's known as the founder of a tradition on the basis of a text that bears his name and which refers to him as a leader. The text is similar to Confucius's Analects in that many of its passages claim to express the views of Mozi. They begin with Mozi said and follow with an explanation of the implications of that statement. Because the Moist tradition is less well known to many of us, I think, than Confucianism and Taoism, I'll say a little bit about it to bring up its contributions to debates during the Warring States period. And the Warring States period runs from 475 to 221 uh, BCE. The ideas proposed by the Moist were not popular with the erudite scholar officials of the time as the Moe's ideas challenge the officials' ideals and practices. The Moe's text includes two chapters entitled Against Confucianism. The text is overtly critical of the Confucians, the Wu. So that's the character for uh, Wu, people of learning. Um, and from the Moe's perspective, uh, the Ru led privileged lives that were a drain on resources that should be shared more widely. So the term Ru is often translated as literati. They prided themselves on their moral cultivation informed by learning in the six arts. And here are the Confucian six arts. Ritual propriety, music, archery, charioteering, calligraphy, and mathematics. From the Mozart's perspective, activities like these, uh, the, the Mozart specifically picks out um, ritual propriety and uh, benevolence, we'll talk about that later, um, and music as well, um, as it believed that these practices were highly subsidized activities for an elite Just to add to that mix, um, here is a beautiful painting from around 1437. And this is a, this is a picture of Confucian harmony, elegant gathering in the apricot garden where everything is in its place. Uh, people who are more important are, of course, uh, bigger um, in, in the way they are represented. Um, and, and there they are, right at the front, with all uh, the backdrop of the uh, beautiful trees. The Mortis picture of Ruiz's life gives us a different perspective on Confucianism. It reveals to us how the lives of the Confucian literati might have been perceived by outsiders during the Warring States period. The most criticism of the Confucians was not merely a struggle for social status and material well-being. The Mozart presents an alternative view of moral life that was in some ways a compelling argument for equality. Although its view of human well-being is rather diminished, as we will see, exploring Mozart's philosophy provides an opportunity for us to encounter the views of those who were outside the inner circle of the political advisors. Being in a position of very little or no authority in matters of the state, the most relied on argumentation rather than appeal to authority or tradition to substantiate their views. The Mozu uses a range of argumentative strategies, including appeal to intuition, reasoning by analogy, hypotheticals, reductio ad absurdum, which is the strategy of taking an opponent's view to its logical conclusion, which is an absurd view. And we'll see uh, a couple of examples of that. And also a rejection of the appeal to custom or tradition. Across these users of argument in the Mozu, 
There is an underlying assumption of objectivity. The arguments are presented to persuade all who encounter them. It is fascinating to see how such argumentative strategies we utilize in Chinese philosophy articulated more than 2,500 years ago from a set of thinkers who did not belong to the ruling elite to make a case for equality. And this is what I'll attempt to bring out this evening. I'd like to say a little bit about, about argumentative strategies and objectivity um, and a lot, um, a lot, I've learned a lot from the work of uh, Jeffrey Lloyd, um, who has talked about the argumentative styles of uh, early, the early Chinese and the ancient Greeks. And um, uh, in one of his books, um, in a few actually, he, he, he um, carves this out um, quite nicely uh, when the early Greek philosophers were uh, expressing their views, they were expressing their views uh, to the assembly. They were, there were lots of people, the free men, who were there and, and they had to speak to the gallery. Quite unlike that, in early Chinese philosophy, uh, across the same period of time, roughly, the Warring States again was between uh, 475 uh, to 221 BCE. So, um, in terms of the argumentation of uh, uh, that we find in the texts, um, they are not speaking to a large number of people. There is a lot of persuasion going on in the texts. But these texts would have been circulating around, uh, would have circulated um, to smaller groups of people. And so the argumentative styles, um, Jeffrey Lloyd thinks there is, there is something in this when one has to uh, persuade the assembly um, as opposed to having to uh, try to convince the ruler or an important official. Uh, making sure that you have his ear, for instance, it, it, it's quite a different uh, practice altogether. Um, and, and, and Jeffrey Lloyd thinks that this contributes to the different argumentative styles. Well, if that is, if that is the case, in Mozu we find something quite different. And that's what I'm trying to articulate today. I, I think the Mozu used uh, argumentative strategies that I believe are meant to work um, for anyone who comes across the text. There are four sections in my talk. After introducing the text and the people behind it, I discuss the substance of Moist philosophy in the second and third sections. The final section, A Measure for Our Actions, highlights the simplicity of Mozart's proposal for a moral standard, a user-friendly morality. It also emphasizes how elements of philosophical argumentation are used to undergird the Moist course. I'll say a little bit about the text. The Mozu is a 71 chapter text, although um, in their uh, 18, among these 18 uh, chapters have been lost. The first set of 39 chapters up until uh, Against the Confucians, uh, they belong to an earlier layer, it seems. The final 32 chapters are often called the later Moist chapters and they begin from the canons or the dialectical chapters. Uh, six of them, uh, the canons, are attempts to characterize and systematize uh, the uses of language and its place in life. The chapters also include illustrations about how reasoning operates with examples from geometry, astronomy, optics and mechanics. And these chapters are laden with philosophical argumentation and rich with examples of how these thinkers thought about language and logic. But they're also quite technical. Uh, therefore, in this evening's lecture, I'll focus on the ideas in the core chapters um, the, between uh, 8 to 37. And uh, I want to focus on the competing visions of the Moists and the Confucians and the, the philosophical contributions of the Moists. Uh, to the debates of the Warren States period. 
So on the basis of the Mozart's arguments, we can assume its authors were familiar with manual craftsmanship. I say this because the text often substantiates its views by analogizing how we might organize aspects of human life with the use of measuring instruments, such as compasses and plumb lines. In addition, the language of the mortar is stylistically quite unrefined, suggesting a non-elite provenance. Its ideas are expressed quite repetitively uh, in rather long-winded ways, and they go through multiple examples uh, to make a point. This aspect of the text, together with the examples it uses in its arguments, suggests that the status of the Moists, or of those who wrote in the name of Mozu, was not significant. They were by no means part of the in-group with the Bru scholar officials. The features of the Mozu, as well as its arguments, appear to have affected its reception and transmission a text whose language is less polished and which argued against the prevailing elite vision of life would have garnered less respect and interest in official contexts. In an earlier lecture, I noted that many early Chinese texts were circulated with commentaries. So there's a text, for instance, the Analects bearing the words of Confucius, uh, supposedly, and uh, people, uh, scholars would annotate with, with, lots and, with lots of critical commentaries, and these were uh, circulated. Sometimes the commentaries uh, acquired more significance than the actual texts themselves. However, this was not the case with the Mozu. It did not attract commentators. Naturally, thinkers only commented on texts that were of interest to them, and I suspect there is an element of not bothering to comment on or to distill the ideas of the text if its views are critical of existing power structures and moreover are expressed in an unrefined way. It's also telling that there is scant information on the Moist themselves. There is some mention of a small number of individual Moist identities, but these references do not tell us about um, these men and what they actually thought. So they're, they're mentioned in texts and, and um, that, is all, uh, that is how they appear. This again could reflect a lack of, lack of interest in the mortars, authors, and ideas during and after the War of States period. In spite of the lack of interest in the mortar across periods in Chinese history, the text did become an object of focus in the early 19th century when there was a wave of interest in westernization in China. At this time, an influential thinker, Hu Shu, who was an early 20th century um, Thinker, he believed that the Mortis' innovations in methodology, rather than Confucian ideas, could help with Sino-Western exchanges then. Hu's book is entitled The Development of Logical Method in Ancient China, and it was published in 1928. He sought to demonstrate the closer alignment of the Mortis' ideas with and its receptiveness to philosophy and science from the West. Some contemporary scholars, and I count myself among them, believe that Mozu, rather than Confucius, is China's first philosopher. <laughs> How is this so? Is not the Analects a philosophical text as well? The Analects is a text in which Confucius expresses his views, or is said to express his views. I, I don't think Confucius had a hand in the Analects at all. Um, um, but Confucius is seldom called to justify them. So the name of Confucius, Confucius says in, in the passages of the Analects, um, it, it's a borrowing, it's a borrowing so that the views get um, attention and airtime uh, on the basis of Confucius's authority. Where in the Analects Confucius is asked for reasons for his decisions, he articulates situation-specific reasons rather than general principles that guide decision-making. In the Analects, Confucius does not justify why it is that benevolence, ritual, or rightness are the foundational principles or virtues, even though he says they are. Nor does he provide reasons why the ideal society should have a hierarchical moral structure of moral leaders and followers. Now don't get me wrong, the Confucian tradition following Confucius, you find lots and lots of philosophizing and, and argumentation in there, but um, it's very hard to locate that in the Analects. 
The mozza is quite different from this. Whereas the passages in the Analects often simply state the case, the mozza presents arguments for its claims. Perhaps this is because its authors find themselves on the back foot, attempting to establish a vision of society quite different from what was offered by the Bru, while lacking the letters, prestige or social authority. As we will see, the mozza not only disagrees with the Confucians, it presents reasons for rejecting Confucian values. In doing so, it sets out criteria for assessing different positions, and these were intended for use by anyone, not only by those who had the luxury of a cultivated life. In other words, their arguments offer a level of detachment and perhaps some level of objectivity <coughs> as they turn the focus from Confucianism's reliance on exemplary individuals. I will have more to say about the argumentative strategies of the Mozart in the sections to follow, beginning in the next section, where I'll seek to show how the Mozart establishes its views while at the same time rejecting Confucian philosophy. The Mozu rejects a number of aspects of the Confucian vision and the Mozu considers only two alternatives. So this is something we have to keep remembering when you read the text. It sees itself as one position, uh, its own as one position and the Confucian position as the other. And if one's wrong, therefore the other must be right. But you'll see how the arguments address uh, both horns um, at the same time. Um, uh, so the Mozart's primary criticisms of Confucianism uh, cover both the primacy that Confucianism attaches to close relationships as the basis for the moral life and social order. So it criticizes Confucian relational morality and secondly it criticizes Confucian ritual uh, and music. And, and I'll look at each one of these in turn. For the Confucians, relationality is crystallized in the idea of benevolence, which begins at home. It's nurtured in the practices of filial piety, and an individual's conceptions of caring are developed in that context. From there, people learn to interact in appropriate ways with others, expanding their circles of relationship in due course. However, the Confucian emphasis on relational distance is portrayed by the Moists, as one that fragments our moral and social networks. So it turns uh, something Confucian into something quite undesirable. This is from the Mozart. The Confucians say, in treating relatives as relatives, there are gradations. In respecting the worthy, there are gradations. They speak of the differences of near and distant, honored and lowly. The Confucian practice of first developing close personal ties is not sustainable, according to Mozu, as it encourages us to make distinctions between people in our moral lives. This approach, they say, does not help address the prevalent self-serving attitudes across all levels of society. Uh, so as the Mozu says, we, uh, society is bad enough, we don't need any help to fragment it further. Uh, lack of care is the problem. Now the various lords know only to care about their state and don't care about other states and hence they don't hesitate to deploy their state to attack other states. Now people know only to care about themselves and don't care about others and hence they don't hesitate to deploy themselves to injure other selves. This passage is extremely long. <laughs> um, it talks about care uh, across um, all different sectors of society. So these attitudes are the cause of subversion, resentment and hatred and they need to be replaced by morality grounded in inclusion. More specifically, inclusive care of each person for everyone else. And that's the, uh, um, the Moist uh, practice of Jian Ai, it's an inclusive care. Um, the Mozart prevent, uh, presents many scenarios in which people benefit from the practice of inclusive care, from peaceful states right down to the old without wives or children and orphan children. It says if we practice inclusive care, everyone will be looked after. 
and given that inclusive care effectively delivers these outcomes, there is every reason to take this approach to secure a flourishing society. By contrast, a Confucian approach which seeks to entrench gradations is not only ineffectual for the Moist, it actually produces the opposite outcomes. Um, in a short passage which discusses which comes first, in, um, and which comes first meaning uh, should we practice the Confucian, uh, should we practice Confucian bene benevolence first, that is starting with uh, relationships, close, close nurtured relationships from within the family, or should we start with just advocating inclusive care? If we first engage in caring about and benefiting others' parents, will others then reciprocate by caring about and benefiting our parents? Or do we first, uh, or do we first engage in detesting and injuring others' parents, and then others reciprocate by caring about and benefiting our parents? <laughs> Surely, it's that we first engage in caring about and benefiting others' parents, and then others reciprocate by caring about and benefiting our parents. So you get a sense of the detail it provides in its argumentation. That being so, then do these reciprocally filial sons turn out to have any alternative? Shouldn't they first engage in caring about and benefiting others' parents? Or do you take the filial sons of the world to be so ignorant they're incapable of doing what's correct. Notice here how Mozu pushes the Confucian position into a corner, quite unfairly, arguing that it's absurd to defend the Confucian view. It's a rather aggressive example, I think, of uh, the reductio ad absurdum. And the Mozu's representation of Confucian philosophy here that it leads to people detesting and enduring others' parents is inaccurate. Nonetheless, the point about the Mortz's use of argument remains. But to return to the broader theme, the Mortz rejects what it sees as the circuitous route the Confucians would need to take in order to bring peace and stability to society. According to the Confucian approach, cultivating close personal ties will instill benevolence, rightness, and propriety. And these attitudes and practices will in turn enhance our expanding circles of relationships with others. However, more to doubts that this approach will get us there. That is, to a situation where individuals will look out for all others. As the Moists see it, the incompatibility between Moist TNI inclusive care and Confucian benevolent relationships arises from fundamental differences in the two views. Not only do they disagree on the most effective method to achieve a flourishing society, their understanding of what is valuable in human relationships is conflicting. TNI promotes bringing everyone inclusively into one's caring practices, whereas Confucian benevolence brand is essentially grounded in fruitful relationships with specific others. Albeit it's meant to grow, but the most think it will never get there. So let me sum up here how the motto makes its case for TNI, while at the same time rejecting Confucian benevolence. We may understand three strands of uh, the Moe's argument. So establishing the case for TNI is also a rejection of Confucian morality. Motto, prevents, uh, motto presents scenarios of discord and disregard for others, as well as scenarios in which people are looked after, and um, this is an appeal to our intuitions, which is better. And of course this is obvious, um, and, and Mozart asks this plain to the gallery. The second strand of the Mozart's argument, um, where our, intuition, our intuitions about the scenarios uh, presented are an expression of our desire for a particular type of outcome. That outcome is benefit for one and all. So, in this strand, um, Mozu identifies the basis on which we have distinguished the desirable from the undesirable. It's based on our, our intuitions. Um, the outcome we seek, the Mozu says, is invariably benefit to all. In its third step, uh, in order to attain benefit for one and all, inclusive care practices 
are most effective. So here it works backwards from the outcome of benefit for all to propose an approach that most effectively attains that outcome. What is required the more to argue is inclusive care. So in the next passage I'm going to uh, share with you, have a look at how more to recalibrate um, the idea of REM. The Netherlands again for the Confucians is um, a virtue that begins within the family uh, essentially with a parent's uh, care for their children and this is meant to grow and be nurtured. In, the, in Mota's hands it turns into uh, benevolence is something quite different. So this is Mota speaking. Previously I stated the task of benevolent people is surely to diligently seek to promote the benefit of the world and eliminate harm to the world. Now I fundamentally investigated what inclusion produces and it is great benefit to the world. Now I have fundamentally investigated what partiality produces and it is great harm to the world. For the Motu, the value of benevolence is instrumental. If you look at that first statement there, it consists in securing benefit. It's not the primary virtue. You advocate benevolence because it gets you the outcomes uh, and it eliminates harm. Because inclusive care brings benefit to all, the benevolent person would seek to embody inclusive care. The Moist conception of benevolence uh, turns the Confucian conception on its head. For the Confucians, run is central to human well-being not a means to secure material well-being. The second move the motto makes here in that second paragraph um, is to accuse the Confucians of promoting partiality. The term for partiality, bie, indicates a distinction make, made on the basis of otherness. To say something is bie to say, is to say that it's other. Earlier, we saw a different expression of otherness in how the Mozart criticizes Confucianism's use of gradations. And to use gradations is to create that otherness um, because um, the Confucians are using relationships, are uh, focusing on relationships and marking relational distance. The Mozart also offers an interesting thought experiment intended to demonstrate the untenability of the Confucian position. It asks us to imagine a scenario in which a man has to go away for a mission. To whom would he entrust his family? So if you're going away on a mission, would you leave your family as a man? Would you leave your family with uh, someone who practices partiality? Or would you leave your family with someone who practices uh, this uh, inclusive care. That's the passage. Let us ask to whom would he entrust the support of his parents and the care of his wife and children? Would it be to the person who upholds inclusiveness, Tian, for Tian Ai, or to the person who upholds partiality? It seems to me that on occasions like these, there are no fools in the world. <laughs> Those who deem inclusiveness wrong would surely think it best to entrust his family to the person who upholds inclusiveness. This thought experiment has served as a lively discussion group, uh, as a discussion topic in many Chinese philosophy tutorials. We can come back to this during a Q&A if anyone wants to bring it up. I've mentioned it here to demonstrate the range of arguments the Morton launches against the Confucians. We next consider Mota's criticisms of the Confucian practices of ritual propriety and music. It is a drain on resources to keep up with the Confucian <coughs> rituals, according to the Mota. For example, there is a chapter entitled Moderation in Burials and an extended discussion of burial practices and customs. According to a prevailing view, and one that the Confucians would have held, in order to demonstrate filial piety, a person had to provide for extravagant rituals, as well as undertake prolonged mourning uh, to mark a parent's death. This was an expression of filial piety. 
but more to contend that people put on lavish funeral rites, merely because that was a customary thing to do. They're just too expensive. And, um, and in criticizing uh, the, uh, the reliance on, uh, the, uh, on custom, Mota says this is what's called deeming the habits convenient and their customs righteous. But that in itself, um, an appeal to, uh, to custom doesn't really override the fact that they're so expensive. By the same token, music was seen as an indulgence, as the production of musical instruments, as well as the production of music, is resource intensive. Now, kings, dukes, and great men, if they manufacture musical instruments, deeming this a service to the state, don't make them simply by scooping them up from the water or digging up from the soil. They must collect heavy taxes from the myriad people to make the sounds of the great bells and sounding drums, zithers and lutes, and flutes and pipes. The Mozu has more to say. The benefits from music are disproportionately distributed. The people do not benefit from them. Mozu runs his argument by way of analogy, actually by disanalogy. Vehicles are expensive to construct, yet that's a worthwhile undertaking as all stand to benefit, but that's not the case for music. The ancient sage kings too once collected heavy taxes from the myriad people to make boats and carts. Once these were finished, people said, how will we use these? They said, the boats are used on water, the carts are used on land, the gentlemen rest their feet with them, the commoners rest their shoulders and backs. <laughs> and the disanalogy, the boats and carts in return benefited the people. That being so, if the use of musical instruments was analogous to the sage kings making boats and carts, I wouldn't dare deem it wrong. We might be concerned that Mozu took such a dim view of the benefits of music. It's worth noting, however, that the music he was referring to was music associated with courtly ritual, rather than music that would have been more generally available to the people. Now let me summarize what we've discussed so far. Mozu establishes a dual-pronged argument. We should seek benefit for everyone, and secondly, the best way to do that is for all to practice inclusive care. On the basis of these two arguments, he rejects two major aspects of the Confucian position, the first being Confucian benevolence, the concern for humanity that develops from the cultivation of special relationships and the second being Confucianism's ritual practices. These ritual practices are both resource intensive and their outcomes are not equally shared. Let's move next to examine Mozart's idea of benefit for all. In establishing a set of outcomes as a fundamental part of moral life, Mozart offers a version of consequentialism. When we speak of consequentialism, one of the first questions we ask is, what outcomes are being sought? That is, what is consequential according to this view? The outcomes sought in the Mozu are quite focused on what is good for society as a whole, rather than, say, the happiness of individuals. For Mozu, the three goods that should be sought are a wealthy state, a populous nation, and socio-political order. With these three goods realized, society will thrive and be stable, will thrive and be stable and indirectly individuals will benefit. However, the most package of goods does not take into account the emotional and psych psychosocial well-being of individuals as such, and therefore might be thought to be fairly basic. At this point, one might come to the defense of Confucian philosophy, suggesting that there is more to Confucian benevolence and ritual propriety than more to the last form. Relational affection that is an integral part of relationships and the respect and, our, and reverence that are central to Confucian propriety are not represented in Mozart's consequentialism. What is also significant is Moism's radical departure from Confucianism's emphasis on virtue as a primary feature of humanity to focus on outcomes. Now I move on to discuss two features of Mozart's consequentialism. <coughs> First, a fairer distribution of goods, and second, the attempt by the most to take morality out of the hands of the rule officials. So in relation to uh, a fairer distribution of goods, 
um, I turn now to how the authors sought to ground or justify their belief in a more equitable distribution of benefits. As we have seen, the Moas were no match for the rural scholars, either in their learning or social status. They could not offer an alternative vision based on their learned or perspicacious insights or on the basis of their standing in society. I believe the Moas were keenly aware of their lack of standing and they looked to heaven, a source that transcended human effort, status or achievement to uh, ground their argument. They adeptly used the discourse of their time by appealing to heaven's intent or heaven's will as the basis of their consequentialism. And the motto says in this regard, Now in the world there are no great or small states. All are heaven's towns. Among people there are no younger or elder, noble or lowly, all are heaven's subjects. Hence none fail to fatten oxen and sheep, feed hounds and pigs, and prepare pure offerings of wine and grain to reverently serve heaven. Is this not inclusively possessing them and inclusively accepting offerings from them? If heaven inclusively possesses them and accepts offerings from them, how could it not desire people to care about each other and benefit each other? There is quite a lot. This is only one passage on heaven's beneficence. There is a uh, Another passage, for instance, where it talks about how uh, heaven inclusively cares about um, everything, uh, virtually everything. It says it sends down snow, frost, rain, and dew to grow the five grains, hemp, and silk. It lets the people benefit from the resources. It arranged the mountains, rivers, streams, and valleys, assigned the hundred officers to monitor the people's good and bad conduct. It set up the king's dukes and lord, making them reward the worthy and punish the vicious. Um, these dukes and lord also collect metal and wood, birds and bees, and undertake production of the five grains, hemp and silk, hemp and silk to serve as the people's resources for clothing and food. So all in all, uh, an extremely beneficent heaven, um, and it, it, it sounds uh, like a version of intelligent design. This is how it works, and this is because heaven looks after us. It's the benefactor that is paradigmatically inclusive. And heaven's beneficence is exactly the model for inclusive care. Heaven cares for everyone inclusively and impartially. Therefore, it's the anchor for Mortis consequentialism. <clears throat> I'll continue talking about um, the role of heaven uh, by moving on to uh, the second um, strand in, in Motus consequentialism taking morality out of the hands of the Confucians. An important implication of Motus' appeal to heaven's intent is to identify heaven as the ultimate moral authority, as we see. By doing so, Motus takes the determination of moral values out of the hands of the Confucians. Whereas in Confucian philosophy, exemplary people most notably the sage kings, lead by their charisma and exemplary lives. In Moist philosophy, there is only one relevant model, and that is heaven. No mediator is required. Even if sage kings rule in this earthly domain, heaven is the model for one and all. This is a, this is a funny um, argument. When I read it, I had to laugh. Our master Morton said, there are grounds by which I know heaven is more noble and knowledgeable than the son of heaven. So the son of heaven is a Confucian figure. He's the divine ruler. I say, when the son of heaven does good, heaven can reward him. I've never known heaven to pray for blessings to the son of heaven. This is now, this is how I know heaven is more noble and knowledgeable than the son of heaven. So there's an ultimate authority um, heaven is the one who rewards the son of heaven and it, it's, it's, it's a very simple argument that says, well, who does heaven pray to? Heaven doesn't need to pray to anyone, but the son of heaven, well, he needs to still pray to heaven. So we know who the higher authority is. So in this statement, then, Mortu uh, puts the son of heaven, revered by the Confucians, in his place. Um, for me, this indicates that the Mortis authors were deeply aware of what they needed to do 
to challenge the Confucian vision. Of course, we might question Mortis' assertion that what heavens reveals to us coincides exactly with Mortis' vision. For warring states thinkers, however, it was generally and commonly accepted that heaven oversaw humanity's ethical life. By these lights, Mortis' claim that heaven is the model would have had considerable purchase. Lots were claiming heaven's authority, so in that way it, it's not so unusual. To sum up what we've considered in relation to Mortis' consequentialism, we've seen the strategies taken by Mortis to establish benefit for all. The most significant moves made in the text are its attempts to unsettle the basis of Confucian morality and to broaden the aim of morality to directly benefit the many, especially in terms of material well-being. The motto is familiar with the discourse of the rule officials and it confidently alters the meaning of key terms uh, to establish its account. It appeals to heaven as the model of bene beneficence, anchors the Moist ideal in a source beyond the reach of humanity, even of the Confucian son of heaven. In the final section of my lecture, I'd like to examine how for the Moists, heaven's model may be applied to human conduct. The way humans may draw on heaven as a model in Moist thought is to use its beneficence as a standard. Using heaven as a standard is analogous to the wheelwright using a compass or a carpenter using a set square. And this is what I mean by the authors of the text being very familiar with uh, craftsmanship. Mortis said, those in the world who perform tasks cannot do without models and standards. Even officers serving as generals or ministers, they all have models, even the hundred artisans performing their tasks. They too all have models. The hundred artisans make squares with the set square, circles with the compass, straight lines with the string, vertical lines with the plumb line, and flat surfaces with the level. The skilled are able to conform to them exactly. The unskilled, though unable to conform to them exactly, by following them in performing their tasks, still surpass what they can do by themselves. For the Moists, benefit as a standard of measurement for human practices is effective and efficient for a number of reasons. First, there is only one standard and that reduces potential confusion. Second, as the Mozart illustrates with many examples, benefit is applicable to a wide range of situations and thus is uh, fit for different needs. But it is simple. In one passage, the Mozart says the use of the model is like distinguishing black and white. Things either measure up or they don't. Fourth, it is clear it's not difficult to understand benefit and after all, Mozart has shown he appeals to our intuitions about benefit. Finally, it can be used by anyone, skilled or unskilled. In short, the Mozu offers a democratizing account of morality that any user may apply when reflecting on their actions. It seeks to bring moral deliberation to the people, even though the measure is basic and not much initiative is required to apply it. The authors of the Mozu saw their view of morality as an alternative to the Confucian one, a view that, and the Confucian view was one that they believed was not for the people in more ways than one. Their objection to Confucianism was not only that it unevenly distributed goods, but also that its morality serves to entrench a hierarchy established on the basis of moral cultivation, to which few had access. As outsiders excluded from the privileged courtly life, the authors of the Moses sought to establish standards independent of those endorsed by the elite and which best serve elite lives. The Mozu is a text from the wrong side of the tracks. Its conception of the goods we should seek in life is admittedly limited, um, quite possibly framed by what its authors perceive to be the urgent needs of the time. The utilitarian calculus it proposed was simple, and as we know, the utilitarian calculus is never so simple. A range of goods might be sought, and it's not possible to procure them for everyone most, or even some, of the time. 
Nevertheless, the model offers a vantage point from which to understand how Confucianism was perceived by those for whom the privilege, privileged life was not available. Its key idea, benefit for all, would have aligned with the intuitions of the ordinary people. Anchoring this on heaven's intent, address the moral superiority of the rule officials. And using a moral calculus would have empowered the people, though in a limited way from where we sit. Above all, the Mozart's use of a range of methods of argumentation to unsettle the status quo is fascinating. It established a level of objectivity that was up to that point not significant in Chinese discourse. At the start of the lecture, I mentioned the Mozart's canons, a rather technical later layer of the Mozart so that considers questions about language and reasoning. The canons also consider how we reason and think through examples from geometry, astron astronomy, uh, optics and mechanics, offering a nascent early Chinese scientific methodology. These topics might strike us as being remarkably different from those of the Mortz's core chapters that we've just looked at. However, I believe that the earlier and later layers of the Mortz's both use structured arguments to strengthen their positions. These forms of reasoning are, I suggest, Mo's philosophy's most important contribution to warring states philosophy. I hope I've managed to convince you that the early Moists were China's first philosophers. <laughs> While early Moist consequentialism had a modest goal, it was an impressive attempt to use philosophical tools to articulate what was wrong with the prevailing political culture. Thank you. Mm.